authorities facilitate transfer of asylum seekers. O'Neill invites world leaders to APEC 2018. And Kumu search forward in their campaign. This is National MTV News with Marilyn Diaukatam. Good evening and thank you for joining me with Sunday's news. Authorities facilitating the transfer of the asylum seekers out of Lomrum will be releasing information on the progress of the exercise. They include immigration police and the defense force. So far, over 200 refugees have voluntarily vacated the Manus Regional Processing Center after the Supreme Court's decision. Tekla Gunga reports from Manus. The Manus Regional Processing Center was shut on Tuesday, October 31st, in compliance with a Supreme Court decision of 2016. That same afternoon, asylum seekers filed applications at the Supreme Court to seek interim orders to restore water, electricity and food supplies. However, the Supreme Court refused their applications. Following the applications, asylum seekers voluntarily vacated the center. These transferals are facilitated by security personnel on the ground. These asylum seekers are being transferred to either the East Loringau Transit Center or the West Loringau Hillside House. Those processed as genuine refugees have been taken to the East Loringau Transit Center while those classified as non-refugees to the West Loringau Hillside House. Attempts to get comments from the Manus PPC since yesterday has been unsuccessful. However, he is expected to speak to the media this evening. While those in authority are facilitating the transferals, locals at West Loringau say they disagree with the arrangements. Max Pamelau, a local, says facilities at the West Loringau Hillside House are not yet ready for asylum seekers to move in. He explains that water and electricity supplies are yet to be connected. All is that on him generator 24 hours where this day we all picking in the blomipla, all ready to school 24 hours. Gen said he work lot. Water supply blomipla in a work come in. Blow go inside lo kembe. Ball use in toilet lo way. The locals have had meetings with their political heads, but they claim they have not received favorable responses. Me bless that one them open member blomipla one them governor. They answer to. Manus way, kisi mol kam na yumi logo ti mol pasteng can be close, and then so so lisi blo mi bla ya, all no address him because that new campsite mi bla disagree with all them, all no can come see now because by bagrabi see now the community, the only place where guess it that government is having mi bla sabi is lowering up, but mi bla no kisi men sabro mi bla lo government na still pending now em is tap yet na project you work lo kam all the movie mol kam. But safety blow me black community, me black people blow community. One ember only look look low me black now, me black not like him. Meanwhile, there are still some refugees camping at the decommissioned center in Lombrum, despite water, electricity, and food supplies being cut. This road leads to the Manus Regional Processing Center. It remains restricted to media personnel. Takla Gunga, National MTV News, Lombrum. There is also international pressure on Manus, especially in Australia. This report in New Zealand says while some asylum seekers have opted to vacate the Manus detention centre, others are refusing to leave and are preparing to be forcefully removed. Living in squalor but staying in defiance. This is the inside of Manus Island Detention Centre, still home to 470 refugees. Pictures taken 10 days after the centre officially closed. This is toilets and showers in Pakistan compound. As you see, there is no water, the shower is not working. 
They remain here despite no access to regular food. The electricity is gone. The water turned off. I couldn't spend more than eight hours in that camp without going around the side and vomiting twice. The situation was so appalling. Time is ticking. The remaining occupants had until today to leave. Local authorities have started dismantling makeshift shelters. There are also reports rubbish bins used to conserve water have been destroyed. We're told local police are being directed by Australian officials. It's feared refugees will now be removed with force. The situation has got, you know, has got considerably worse. There are now threats from PNG Immigration and Police that uh, force will be used uh, against the people who are in the, in the detention centre to, to force them out of there. But Australian Immigration Minister Peter Dutton has his own opinion about these pictures, suggesting they show deliberate damage. And people are saying, well, no, I'm not going to leave the old house. Uh, I'm going to stay here, trash the place. That's instead of shifting here to replacement accommodation. But the United Nations says it's not ready. There are also concerns around the refugees' safety in the local community. There are weekly, if not multi-times a week, uh, attacks or robberies of muggings, sometimes vicious with knives and machetes. Refugees News Hub spoke to this afternoon, said they've been assured they won't be forced out today. But still, it's not a matter of if, but when they will have to go. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill has met with other world leaders at the APEC 2017 Leaders Summit in Da Nang, Vietnam. Upon meeting with South Korea's President Moon Jae-in, he assured him of PNG support for peace and stability in the Korean Peninsula. Pierre O'Neill, along with Singapore's Prime Minister and Russia's President Vladimir Putin, are amongst the longest-serving APEC leaders. Among other world leaders the Prime Minister met was New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinta Ardern. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister extended a hand of invitation to the U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson to attend the 2018 APEC Leaders Week in PNG. After briefly meeting at the sidelines of the Asia-Pacific Summit in Vietnam, U.S. President Donald Trump insists Russian President Vladimir Putin assured him that he absolutely did not meddle in the polls. All eyes at this summit were on these two men and what they might give away about the ties between them. For his entire time in office, Donald Trump's been plagued with questions he just doesn't want to hear over what Vladimir Putin might have done to get him elected. They met only briefly here, but President Trump said he did raise the issue of Russian interference in the U.S. elections. He said he didn't meddle, said Mr. Trump. I asked him again. You can only ask so many times. Every time he sees me, Trump said of Putin, he says, I didn't do that. And I really believe that when he tells me that, he means it. I think he's very insulted by it. But those words have led to an angry reaction from some back in the States, where the intelligence communities long determined Russia did meddle in the election. Donald Trump believes an ex-KGB agent over 17 U.S. intelligence agencies. That's outrageous, tweeted Senate Democrat Ben Cardin. The president's denial of facts is troubling. Virginia. But that type of denial is nothing new. For months at rallies, he's been saying it to his supporters. The Russia story is a total fabrication. It's just an excuse for the greatest loss in the history of American politics. That's all it is. President Putin says it's all made up by Donald Trump's opponents too. But if either of them think that'll lay to rest the matter, they are, of course, mistaken. The U.S. Justice Department's investigating the extent to which Russia did interfere, and Donald Trump's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, is currently under house arrest because of information discovered during the investigation. Well, Donald Trump now says all this focus on Russian interference in the U.S. election is costing lives in conflicts like the one in Syria because it's getting in the way of his relationship with Vladimir Putin and so his ability to resolve such issues. But that is not going to stop investigators back in the States determining exactly what did happen with Moscow, the Trump campaign and the election of 2016. National MTV News continues after the break. Stay with us.
90 students from across the country have been selected to pursue their studies in tertiary education under the Australia Award Scholarship Program. This was announced at the annual PNG Australia Alumni Association dinner last week. Meanwhile, the association had its inaugural annual alumni awards to honor contributions made by alumni to the country. The PNG Australia Alumni Association held its annual dinner this week to celebrate the successful recipients of the 2018 Australia Award Scholarship and the work of the association for the year. PNG AAA President Professor David Cavanamore thanked the Australian government for the ongoing partnership with PNG in building the education sector through the scholarship program. A recipient of the scholarship, Grace Nugi, says the scholarship award will not only contribute towards building Papua New Guineans, but will help them make contributions to the community. It is empowering for us because our success is not for ourselves, but it is for a whole group of, a whole village, a whole tribe. And we come back, we're going to come back to make a change in our country, in our homes, in our villages collaboratively uplifting the nation of Papua Meanwhile, the association's inaugural alumni awards was presented to four alumni recognized for their outstanding contributions to the community and country. Dr. Moses Lannan won the Alumni of the Year Award for his outstanding medical research, while the Innovative and Entrepreneur Award was presented to Dr. Joel Warambai. Jacinta Wagambi was awarded the PNG Women in Leadership Award. The Young Leader Award was given to PNG Youth Alliance on HIV and AIDS founder Messi Master. Merlin Diakotam, National MTV News. This may just be the answer for working class citizens living in the settlements. A new land allocation scheme established by one family, one home director, Stephen Kilage. It aims to secure land titles for families living on government and customary land to stop future evictions. Individuals will be able to purchase the land at a reasonable price of 12,000 kina through fortnightly installments of 100 kina. As Stephen Kilage explains the benefits of owing a land title at the cost of 12,000 kina, he says this project will help Papua New Guineans who are desperate to own their own home. To get awareness so online layers are, so are some titles are important. And how do we get titles? Uh, put pressure on our politicians right now. They need to start putting pressure on our politicians to get the subsidized titles. Allow more citizens low BAM titles. So. The project will stop evictions and secure land through one family, one home land allocation project. It's just lack of knowledge. So people in the settlement, we don't, uh, they don't know that, uh, know what title them. Once a foreign company comes and gets a title, they're all evicted and they've got no rights. I've seen a lot of families being evicted in ATS and a lot of areas. Uh, you see these little kids here, they grew up in the city. They don't know any better, so we have to try to educate them through. Individuals who apply for and complete their payments in the period of five years will qualify for the land, which will be subdivided and titles given direct from the lands department. The scheme is to simply assist the PNG government to provide solutions for ordinary citizens. Meanwhile, NCD Governor Paul Spakop, Housing and Urbanization Minister John Kaupa, and Lands Minister Justin Techenko have had talks to combat settlement issues in the city and to turn settlements into proper suburbs. Godwin Eki, National MTV News. We'll have more stories after these short messages. Don't go away. Welcome back. Turning overseas in the U.S., a driver in Oklahoma City has led police on a crazy car chase that lasted for three hours. Schools were put on lockdown as police pursued the man through streets across country and eventually to a pond. The driver of this stolen pickup truck led police in the Oklahoma City area onto interstates, through neighborhoods and in and out of farm fields, leaving officers trailing in a cloud of dust. We're just coming up to Patterson Drive there. News cameras caught the action as the truck cut through parking lots, squeezed through gates and crossed double yellow lines, barely missing oncoming traffic. He's driving in the wrong lane. 
For nearly three hours, the pickup blew past unsuspecting drivers. Police threw stop sticks in front of the truck several times, but the driver always managed to get around them. And several times, officers had their guns trained on the suspect, but did not shoot. He stopped at one point to pull the toolbox out of the back. That's when someone with a gun shot out his back tire. Okay, shooting the tires. He continued driving on the rim, leaving crop circles in the fields. The chase got very tense when a cop car hit the pickup, almost sending it into a news van. According to local news reports, the suspect went on Facebook Live during the chase to apologize and ask for an attorney. The truck finally came to a stop in a field, the driver backing into a pond. Maybe this will end it. The driver revved his tires to try to get out, then jumped out and started running, his pants falling down. That's when police ended it. Got taser pulled. Finally leading the suspect off the field in handcuffs. The world's top athletes are serial world travelers, but many don't have much time for sightseeing. We take you closer to the North Pole, where the top skiers are competing in World Cup skiing in Norway. However, they don't get much chance to fully explore the Arctic Circle's ultimate playground. The World Cup tour takes the skiers to some of the coolest places in the world, but none more frozen than this one. Levy, Finland, in the Arctic Circle. A winter playground that's about more than just skiing. If you feel the need for speed, this is for you. It's definitely as fast as I've ever been on snow. <laughs> Of course, there's more traditional ways to move around Levy. This and this. Reindeers have been used for transportation and their meat for hundreds of years. And it's only here in Levy that a reindeer is awarded to the winner of the World Cup race each year. Now, however, it's time for a different sport. I can't quite believe I'm walking on ice in the middle of a lake. This is my local market. This is your local fish market right here. A fish! How exciting. I have good luck, yes? You have. It's not only the fish that's fresh. We're told the air here is some of the cleanest in the world. Well, that was very, very cold. It's time now to warm up. And my local friends here have cooked up some delicacies on the fire. Hey, guys. People up here love to eat healthy and clean. Most of these ingredients are picked from the local forests. Stinging nettle seeds, they kind of have a texture to them that mm -hmm. makes them a little bit like chia seeds, they pop a bit, yeah. but they're also like a superfood. Yummy. In fact, people in Lapland love nature so much they can't help but embrace it. What are we doing out here, Rita? This is the Finnish meditation. This is my halipu, my hugging tree. Well, I mean, it, it might look silly, but uh, there's actually scientific research done into the effect of forests and trees on people. It takes down stress levels and it boosts immune system. From mind clearing to mind numbing. Here we go. I'm actually extremely scared right now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just like that. Oh my goodness. Oh gosh, it's cold. But the Finns say this favourite pastime is healthy as it helps to boost blood circulation. No matter which sport you choose to dive into, this weekend it's all about the skiing when the world's best racers will compete in the only race to take place this close to Santa. Trigger Sports is next. Don't go away. Tokai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. The Kiwis clash with Tonga was easily the most anticipated match in the other pools of the Rugby League World Cup. 
It hasn't disappointed with passion and physicality boiling over even before kickoff. In the end, Tonga won 28 to 22. Jason Tamalolo turned his back on the Kiwis. Today he had to face up to them. The fiery exchanges started pre-match and continued on field. The Kiwis were kept at bay in the opening 10 minutes, with Jordan Rapana missing an early opportunity, leaving it to his opposite to get the ball rolling. Rapana made up for his early error, scoring on the half-hour mark. Wonderful offload to Johnson. Here goes to oh, Rapana. As the score increased, tempers started to flare, promoting a warning from the referee. I just want you to stop your blokes running in. OK, thanks. Tonga had chances, but the Kiwis would go into the break 16-2 up. He offloads the but it was the underdogs who would draw first blood of the second spell. Shortly after, Fussy Tua had the crowd on their feet again. The match all set up for a nail-biting finish. And the try, 16 all with the kick to come. Tonga looking like they could claim a famous upset. There's going to be another try. Another try. Kangaroos coach Mal Meninga has praised his team's defence after they shut down Lebanon 34 nil in last night's match. It will be a nervous wait for David Clemmer and Aaron Woods, who were both reported for incidents in last night's game. The Kangaroos' perfect record in the group sta uh, stage sets up a quarter-final against Samoa. Meninga is hoping they will be able to play more freely in the knockout stage. Oh, well, defensively we're outstanding, you know, so we had to do a lot of work tonight defensively. You know, we turned the ball over more than we, we normally do. I think we only completed about 73%, you know, so, um, so we had to work hard defensively. So I was very pleased with that, and, you know, and, uh, which, and the things that we worked on through the week with our defence, I thought was was very good. Uh, with the football, um, you know, once we, you know, once we were a bit more composed with the football and and uh, and just running hard and supporting each other and find the ground, trying to trying to get quick play of the ball, um, and then we play off the back of that. I thought you know we handled that a bit better in this in this second half, but I certainly think we can play a lot better with the ball um, if you know we're allowed to play you know through the finals. It was a sound performance for the Kangaroos, with Cameron Munster scoring a double. Tom Travoyevich has also put his hand up to play a big part in the quarterfinals. Maloney oh, picked up there, Holmes is into space. Support on the inside, here comes Travoyevich. And Travoyevich will get the pass from Holmes. And there is another Kangaroos try. And the future of Australian rugby league gets a try. We'll bring you the Kumus match after the break. <laughs> True Kai Sports. Welcome back. Team NCD has now confirmed a total of 341 athletes and officials to the Games in West New Britain. In a bonding session yesterday, Team NCD chef de mission Numa Alu confirmed they will be competing in 19 of the 23 sports at the Games. The first batch of NCD's 341 athletes and officials will be departing for West New Britain on Thursday. The second lot will follow on Friday. Unfortunately, NCD's AFL, Rugby 7s, Softball and Soccer teams will not be making their appearances at the Games due to accreditation issues. But the sizable number attending has a couple of gold medal defenders such as the kickboxing and basketball teams. In an effort to create strong team spirit before arriving in Kimbe, the bonding session yesterday saw introductions and some exhibitions from athletes. Notably, the kickboxing team is bringing seven kickboxes with the youngest being 14 years old. So we are confident, quietly confident, it's no predictions as to how many gold medals we will win, 
where we will finish. But we are quite confident from the management point of view. And I'm sure from team management point of view and management of NCDC, we are quietly confident that we will do well. Like I said, no, predict no predictions about the number of gold medals, but you can rest assured we're going to do very well for the national capital. Most of the competing athletes are from team sports such as cricket, netball and volleyball. While encouraging the athletes to be great ambassadors of NCD to other provinces, Alu also reminded them to uphold true sportsmanship. Wish everyone, wish all of you in their respective sports all the best. You don't want your training and preparations to be, to be wasted. So I am sure, like the management of Team NCD, the management of NCD, our big boss, the patron, the governor, and all our members of NCD, they want us to do well. And I am sure you don't want to waste your preparation and your training. So let's put our best foot forward for NCD. For NCD's basketball team, this will be the third time to defend the medals consecutively. And only the cricket team will be arriving in Kimbe after the opening ceremony as the competition starts four days into the games. Dinero Strico National MTV Sports. In rugby union, a determined Wallaby side has kicked off the UK leg of its tour with a 13th successive win over Wales 29-21. Halfback Will Genya was named man of the match. Australia scored four tries to two, including after a piece of magic from fullback Curly Beale, who ran half of the field unopposed to give the Wallabies a comfortable advantage. They then held off the home side, who scored a late try to get the margin to single figures. Australian captain Michael Hooper says his team showed character to defend against Wales after he was sent off. Yeah, of course, there was concern, but. Um you know, coming through the other side, and I'm, I'm really proud of the guys digging deep. Uh, you know, made them score that one just in the corner there to, to finally get points. Um, really shows a lot of heart from our team. Halfback Will Genia was named man of the match. Mate, it was a great game to play. We knew that they'd look to move the ball, particularly with two playmakers on the side. And, you know, what a great atmosphere, full house, uh, and, and great rugby to watch. Yeah, definitely. For us, it's about creating that winning mindset, and I thought we played really well in that first half. We were forced to defend for long periods in that second half, and you know, that's all about attitude, and that's all about their mindset and working hard for each other. So, very, very proud of the gutsy effort. The Wallabies next play England at Twickenham next weekend. To cricket, Australia has taken control of the women's ash Ashes test against England in Sydney, thanks to an incredible batting performance from Alice Perry. Perry smashed an unbeatable 213 in Australia's first inning in Sydney Oval, helping them to a healthy lead. England's opener weathered the new ball and the lights to be 40 without loss. Figure deficit, the Australians were keen to make early inroads against England. A lovely stroke down the ground. First runs for Alyssa Healy, and it's a boundary. Resuming her innings at 70, Elise Perry was given oh, well, an early gift to get going. Chasing her maiden international ton, Perry calmly moved into the 90s in the first hour of play and reached the milestone shortly after the drinks break. Yes, it is! Elise Perry, her maiden 100 for Australia, and how happy is she? At the other end, Alyssa Healy upped her aggression as she neared a half century. But she was undone on 45, caught in the deep off Laura Marsh. That brought Tali McGrath to the crease for her first test innings, and she was lucky to survive her first ball. And you would not believe England's best fielder, Heather Knight, has put it down. But she settled quickly as Australia overtook England's first innings total before the tea break. It was slow going after the break as England's bowlers failed to trouble the Australian batting duo. Perry eased her way to 150, only the sixth Australian woman to reach the mark. Very, very well batted. What a day for her. McGrath's measured innings of 47 came to an end when she skied a full delivery from Georgia Elwes. But with the lead now in excess of 100 and a day to play, the hosts appear well placed to claim the test and the series. That ends Chukai Sports with the details after the break. Kai Sport.
True Kai Sports. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. Worth doing with Dulux. And now looking at the weather details for tonight. In the southern region, Port Moresby is showers, Daru brief showers, Kerama thundery showers, Aletau showers and Popondeta afternoon showers. In Mamase, Leh and Wau afternoon showers, Medang showers and thunderstorms, we wear cloudy rain and Vanimo cloudy rain as well. NGI Lorengau afternoon showers, few showers for KVN, showers and thunderstorms for Kokopo and Rabal, Kimbe thunderstorms, showers and Buka afternoon showers. In the Highlands region, Mount Hagen, Groka, Kundiawa and Mendi and Wabek showers and afternoon fog. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. Worth doing with Dulux. That's the way it is this Sunday, the 12th of November 2017. From the news team, pleasant viewing and good night.